Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Dimitri Pravat. I'm the case officer for this application. So good evening, members of the committee and members of the public. Item three before you this evening is an application seeking planning permission for the redevelopment of a 0 0.6 hectare mixed use property on the Western side of Hanger Lane into a 59 room, 59 person co-living scheme within a part three to six story building with two basement levels. Uh, before going over a virtual site tour, I'm just gonna complete the introduction of the, uh, of the item. The host property of number 70 Hanger Lane is located on Hanger Hill Metropolitan Open Land and currently occupied by a two story uh, dwelling house. The four court and side garden to the building provide compacted dirt surfaces that were until recently used for open storage. As the host property is located on Metropolitan Open Land, its redevelopment is required to meet an exception test provided by the NPPF before it can be considered an appropriate use of metropolitan open land. The relevant test is detailed in paragraph 145 of the NPPF and requires the development to be on previously developed land. Sorry, sorry, Alex, what, what you trying? Sorry. Should we just pause for a minute, Dimitri, please? while we sort this out. And if we could just stop, because um, the officer did ask if he was going to do the site visit. In a... Yes, we'll go back to the first slide if we can, please. Thank you. Sorry. Just check one minute. I didn't have my microphone on. I'm just, I don't know if anyone heard me there. The, is it come back on, did you say? So the reason we have to pause is because we, um, we were streaming before and we didn't capture the votes on an application right at the end of the night and we had to bring it back to committee again. So I'd, I'd rather pause now and get back up and running than have to go through the whole um, application again. And I'm sure, I know it's extra time, but it's probably better that we do that than rather than try and do re rerun this again. Just, Councillor Stafford. Sorry to interrupt. I've got the live stream here, and it seems to have stopped before you had the vote on the previous item, just to alert you. I, thank you for letting me know, Greg. So, are we up and running yet? <laughs> or are we likely to be up and running? Um, so, we're just saying that we don't need, even if we did miss that vote, we'll just re, when we get back up and live and running, we can reconfirm it to the, the wider world. But we, it is a public meeting. It's not like it's online completely anymore. So, this is the meeting here. So, having said that, even if we are live streaming or not live streaming, we could go ahead with the this meeting, could we not, Jackie? We could. Um, okay, so welcome back to the world that, that isn't actually in the town hall. Um, right, I think we better start at the top, Dimitri. I'm sorry, but I don't, it looks like we fell out. Oh, I better start with re reaffirming the vote on the last application. The last application was, uh, uh, agreed with a vote of seven, four, and three against. Um, we do, I think that's it in terms of legal uh, speak. I think we've done it. It's an open meeting. It's uh, it's not completely online. Therefore, we went ahead uh, in the spirit of an open meeting and had our vote, and it was and it's counted. So. Moving on to 70 Hanger Lane, this sounds like deja vu. Um, can we start again, Dimitri, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for everyone that missed that, uh, my name is Dimitri Privat, and I'm the case officer for item number three. 
And this item before you is an application seeking planning permission for the redevelopment of a 0.6 hectare mixed use property on the western side of Hangar Lane into a 59 room, 59 person co-living scheme with an apart three to six story building with two basement levels. <clears throat> The host property of number 70 Hangar Lane is located on Hangar Hill Metropolitan Open Land and currently occupied by a two-story dwelling house. The forecourt and side garden to the building provide compacted dirt and gravel surfaces that were until recently used for open storage. As the host property is located on Metropolitan Open Land, its redevelopment is required to meet an exception test provided by the National Planning Policy Framework before it can be considered an appropriate use on Metropolitan Open Land. The relevant test is detailed in paragraph 145 of the MPPF and requires the development to be on previously developed land, contribute to meeting an identified affordable housing need within the area of the local planning authority, and not cause substantial harm to the openness of the MOL. The building proposed would fit in well with its surroundings and constitute a positive addition to both the local townscape, street scene along Harrier Lane, and the setting of the MOL. In addition to optimizing the residential use of the application site, the applicant has agreed to a financial contribution of 1.9 million pounds to be put toward providing off-site low-cost rental housing within the borough. Therefore, the proposal would pass the relevant exception test by A, assisting the local planning authority meeting identified affordable housing need, and B, doing so without causing harm to the openness of the metropolitan open land. In regard to the merits of the proposed accommodation, the co-living scheme would provide a mixture of private spaces, that is 59 bedrooms, and various common areas. The common areas would be provided both internally and externally. They would include a flexible gym space, a flexible lounge space and cinema room, communal kitchen, dining and living areas on the ground, second and fourth floors, as well as outdoor terraces on the, at the fourth floor levels. The careful management of the shared living environment will be secured through the conditioned implementation the submitted operations management plan, which was designed in accordance with policy H16 of the London plan. 45 parties objected to the application, raising concerns about various material planning considerations that were acknowledged and addressed in the committee report. Therefore, the proposal is judged to be consistent with the aims of the relevant national, regional, and local policies and guidance. As such, it is my recommendation that planning permission be granted subject to a stage two referral to the Mayor of London, legal agreements designed in accordance with the heads of terms listed in the committee report and conditions listed in Appendix A of that report. Uh, prior to the next commuting, I did provide a briefing note that had uh, about four things that it did. It provided additional supporting information about the financial viability assessments and reviews conducted by the GLA, our, our own viability assessor, as well as a viability assessor selected by the applicant. In addition to that, uh, it included an amended condition of number 24, as I incorrectly stated that there were three existing crossovers to the property, when in fact, there's only one. There's also a correction that um, uh, the, I stated in, in the committee report that the Ada Loveless uh, COE High School um, is in Metropolitan Open Land. However, it is not in Metropolitan Open Land, but it is within the setting of the Metropolitan Open Land. And lastly, I replaced two images um, that were not the most up-to-date ones, and we will look at them on the screen. So can we go back to the first uh, slide, please? Okay, that, yeah, I can go to the next slide now. As you can see, the application site is denoted with the star on the screen. Uh, you can see that it's on the western side of Hangar Lane. Uh, I just want to point out that the shaded green po uh, portion of that map is what's constituted as metropolitan open land. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is as a site stands today. This was taken earlier this, uh, this morning. Ooh. The previous photo was of the uh, application site from the other side of the street. This is the existing dwelling house that's still on site today. Next photo, please. Uh, this is aerial photography just showing the, uh, the forecourt and how it has been developed and how it has been used as open space. 
you can see in the northwest cor corner of the property, you have the dwelling house and the remainder of the site, mostly hard, not hard standing, but uh, compacted dirt and gravel that was used for open storage purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the next four photos that we're gonna see. It comes from the south of the site. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is looking north to the application site. Next slide. This is a bit further down, looking back towards the application site. You can see the dense vegetation and greening um, that is reflective of the metropolitan open land, but also provides a substantial amount of screening to the property. Next section, uh, slide, please. This is taken uh, to the south of the site. You have to go actually behind the fence to see it, uh, but you can see the application site and the substation on the property to the south. Next slide, please. Further back on the other side of the fencing, looking towards the application site to the north. Next slide, please. Uh, and these next photos are gonna be even further from the south. Next slide, please. This one's actually looking back uh, back down south towards the four-story building at the local high school. Uh, you can see how it's peering above the uh, vegetation. Next slide, please. The same picture across the street. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also see on the, looking back into the conservation area, while those buildings are not in the conservation area, you can see how there's the precedent for the height of buildings that do peak above the vegetation and the treetops. Next slide, please. Uh, the next photos are on the opposite side of the metropolitan open land. Next photo, please. Next photo, please. Uh, the last two photos do show you how on the other side of the metropolitan open land, uh, there is this very, very dense vegetation that actually limits the views into the metropolitan open land. Next slide, please. Here we have the CGI rendering of the proposed building. Next slide. You can see how it look from the south. Uh, the next two slides are just gonna be the uh, elevations we can look back at if necessary. Next slide. Uh, here we just have the floor plans. Next slide, please. Next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. And here we do have um, extracts from the design and access statement that do show you um, what are indicative uh, renderings of the internal rooms for the private rooms, what they would look like, as well as the potential layouts for them. Next slide, please. And lastly, we just have some uh, examples of the communal spaces that would be provided within the building. Um, although I would mention the top right slide to show you at the uh, lowest basement level, or sorry, uh, the upper basement level, what the patio would, would look like, how they are mixed between communal and, um, and private spaces. All right, and that concludes my introduction. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, an objectors video, I think, that uh, I'm, I'm presuming it's no more than three minutes. Um, and we have checked it and we will hopefully play it. And uh, I think the objector couldn't be here in person tonight. That's why they sent this. I think they had a clash of other uh, meetings or, or engagements or, or some other um, thing they had to do. So um, could we play the video when you're ready, please?
this is this is making my mind up that we, we should have people in person. We know that paragraph 145G uh, of the MPPF permits development on brownfield land where it meets an affordable housing need, but crucially, it does not cause substantial harm to openness. Can we can we stop well. it until we can get the pictures? Well, we except that or this, is this site is previously developed and makes a financial contribution. Excuse me, can we can we stop the harm for a caused second? to openness by the development would be substantial. Right. Are there pictures with this? No, it's just, um, just talking head. It's just, um, it's just, just speaking. Okay, right. Sorry, I presume there was pictures with it. Sorry, and I thought we might be miss. Just a man, Mr. Robert Gerd speaking. Right. Okay. Can we start again, please? Sorry, I, sorry to interrupt. I thought we were missing something. We note that paragraph 145G of the MPPF permits development on brownfield land where it meets an affordable housing need, but crucially it does not cause substantial harm to openness on MOL. While we accept that this site is previously developed and makes a financial contribution, the harm caused to openness by the development would be substantial and damaging. We consider the harm to the MOL as indicated in the views provided by the developer, is considerably understated and relies on the visual impact when this is not the sole assessment when considering openness. Development would entail a very large increase in the mass proposed on the site. The current modest two-storey house would be replaced by a large six-storey block, which would occupy most of the available site area. Impact on openness as a visual aspect but there also should be a volume assessment, which has not been carried out. This development would substantially increase the footprint, building height, bulk and floor space, and the difference between the existing and proposed buildings would be huge. To say that this would not cause substantial harm is disingenuous. Allowing such substantial increase in development on MOL would set a very bad precedent for other sites on MOL across the borough. The officer's report erroneously suggests that the recently completed school to the south of the site is an example of the intensification of the Hangar Hill MOL and therefore sets a precedent for this development. This is an error because the site on which the school is situated had already been de-designated from the MOL following a public hearing in order to enable the school to be built. That the fact that the council sought to de-designate land from MOL to allow a four-storey building to be erected should indicate that an even taller development within the MOL would not be appropriate and should not be permitted. The reduction in size as a result of de-designation makes it even more important to preserve what remains and its open appearance. There are other serious concerns with the proposals or quality of accommodation and basement level living, lack of amenity space and the effect of poor air quality on prospective residents and the impact of the traffic to the north circular road, all of which we should seriously consider as reasons for refusal. But the harm to openness is the most obvious reason why this application should be refused. In summary, we think that the alleged benefits of the scheme would not outweigh the harm to the character of the MOL, and the committee should, as it did in the case of the Cornell Leisure Centre scheme earlier this year, refuse the development. Thank you. I didn't time it, so I'm presuming it's three minutes. Um, so on behalf of the applicant, sorry, Oliver, no, uh, Nick Sutton, is that correct? You have three minutes and yes, you are, we'll give you an um, indication at 30 seconds out and then try to stop you at 30 minutes, or we'll stop you at three. 
No problems. Um, my name is Dick Sutton. I'm a planning consultant from Maven Plan, the agents for the application. Um, members will be aware that this property represents a previously developed site within a wider area of MOL, bordered by St. Augustine's Priory School to the north, the Bar former Barclays playing, school, playing Fields to the west, and the recently constructed secondary school fronting Hanger Lane to the south. The proposal was originally submitted as a five-storey scheme comprising 48 co-living units, which delivered an off-site affordable housing contribution of 360,000. However, following consultation with the Mayor of London and the Council's viability consultants, it was concluded that the affordable housing contribution could be increased up to 1.9 million by adding an additional floor without resulting in substantial harm to the openness of the MOL. In this respect, paragraph 145 of the National Planning Policy Framework allows for the redevelopment of previously developed sites within an MOL, provided it doesn't cause substantial harm to openness and it contributes to meeting an affordable housing need. The proposal would meet the first test being no substantial harm to openness for the following reasons. The site is not currently open land, rather it's a previously developed site surrounded by other areas of open land, which in themselves contribute to the openness of this part of the MOL. Although the building is relatively small, it's surrounded by other outbuildings and hard standing formerly used as a builder's yard, which was incongruous with and detrimental to the character and appearance of the MOL. Moreover, these uses provided no public benefit in the form of low cost or affordable housing, nor did they contribute to the emerging townscape or landscape setting of the site. Although the proposal will be taller and wider than the existing buildings, it will occupy a relatively small part of the wider MOL, such that its impact on openness will be negligible. The proposal would be of exceptionally high quality design, incorporating a four storey building to shoulder height with two recessed and lightweight upper floors that will provide an attractive top to the building. This will be complemented by a green wall to the southern elevation, which will reinforce its landscape setting and provide an attractive elevation when viewed from the south. Although the upper parts of the building will be visible above the tree line when viewed from within and beyond the MOL, these will be restricted to long distance views when other buildings would also be apparent, including the St. Augustine school buildings to the North 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 North. North. the new secondary school to the South. In respect of the second test, the proposal would contribute to meeting an affordable housing need by providing a substantial affordable housing contribution that would facilitate the delivery of other affordable housing elsewhere in the borough. The proposal therefore meets the two key policy tests while ensuring the delivery of a high quality co-living scheme in an accessible part of Ealing where the demand for this accommodation has been demonstrated to be high. It's therefore Thank respectfully you. requested that members endorse the officer's recommendation and grant, grant approval. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was nearly three minutes. Okay. We have, uh, you are the ward councillor, aren't you, Councillor Stafford of Hanger Hill, uh, to speak for, and I'll say this to you as well, and I'll say it to every councillor who comes here, up to five minutes, no more than five minutes, certainly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I just want to associate myself uh, with the comments of Dr. Bob Gerd, who you heard speaking a few moments ago. I have objections to this on six major points, and I'll list them now. Firstly, the loss of metropolitan open land, which has already much reduced uh, the size because of the land that was de-designated for the Ada Lovelace School. Two, the impact on the remaining area of the metropolitan open land, especially with regard to height and massing of the proposed development. Three, the significant overdevelopment of such a small site. Four, the establishment of what is to all intents and purposes an HMO, a massive HMO. Uh, five, um, the lack of proper social housing in the development because of the poor and of poor quality units, especially the poor living conditions at basement level and the insufficient amenity space. And finally, the poor standard of air quality because the building is right next to the busy and polluted North Circular Road. So in terms of the loss of MOL, we've already seen a, a, a massive amount of the current MOL removed for the Ada Lovelace School. And don't get me wrong, we wanted the school, but we also want to keep the MOL. And as has already been said by Dr. Gerd, Ada Lovelace is no longer on the MOL. So using that as a uh, precedent is, is, is not appropriate. 
Uh, page 21, I think, cites uh, Ada Lovelace as intensification supportable for Hanger Hill. That, that's simply not the case. We had a massive and lengthy process to de-designate that land. Second, in terms of the impact that this will have on the remaining MO, uh, MOL, um, unfortunately, you will see that um, the, the site um, that, that's there is, uh, is, is not uh, densely uh, urbanized, unlike the uh, planning application you've just seen and approved. This is a completely different site. It's on metropolitan open land. It is not an urban situation. And for the report to say on page 20 that it will have minor or moderate beneficial impact on its environment uh, strikes me as mad. Simply, it will overshadow the two houses next door. It will overshadow the conservation area and the historic church of the Ascension, which is across the road. And the pictures that you've seen, all the vegetation that you've seen is deciduous. So whilst you might not be able to see it in the summer months, in the autumn to winter months, it will be extraordinarily visible across the site. Again, Ada Lovelace's site is justification, but it's much further down the hill. It is so therefore not as high anyway. It's not as high in terms of its stories, and it's considerably further away from other adjacent properties. And once again, it's not on the MOL. Finally, the over, sorry, three, the overdevelopment of the small site. The report itself says on page 21, the application site is mostly undeveloped. The proposal will encompass the whole site built from edge to edge. And like Gurnell which, Gurnell, which was rightly rejected, just because something is already built on the site doesn't mean that it automatically anything, whatever its size and density, can be built on that site. And image seven, I think, which you've got on the, uh, uh, the extra pack for the officer produced today, shows the significantly, how significantly big that thing is against the neighboring properties. I won't go into the HMO, but essentially this is a massive HMO in all but name. 59 rooms, what, it says 59 people, but what's to prevent and what should prevent them having partners, friends, relatives, children living with them when they're there. Just because uh, it's super shiny and superficially uh, wonderful, it's still a massive HMO. There's no, there's no uh, social housing on the development and there's no amenity space. Previous planning committees have criticized the fact that we have too many one bedroom properties, encouragement to build two and three bedroom properties for family living. These are tiny studios that are in direct contravention of previous decisions. There's no social housing. Council has always been keen to, to not offset social housing, but put it on the site. And finally, there's no amenity space for residents, and that's recognized on pages 28 and 29, which says there's a 503 square feet shortfall. And finally, the poor standard of air quality on the North Circular Road, especially when the ULES is extended as far as, but not including the North and South Circulars, will see a significant increase of traffic on the North Circular Road, avoiding the ULES zone. So in conclusion, in Hangar Hill, we have worked extraordinarily hard to allow appropriate building. And for example, the redevelopment of flats where Hangar Lane meets uh, Maidley Road shows an example of where the community has worked together to build flats in an appropriate way. This is not appropriate. It should not be built on metropolitan open land. And I would hope that this committee would refuse it. Six seconds to go. Thank you very much. Before I bring the committee in, I'd, uh, I'd like to bring the officer back if he's got anything to uh, add or discuss about some of the points that have been raised in the yes. video or from the applicant or from the uh, ward councillor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first thing I would like to address is the uh, matter of social housing. As I mentioned before, this was designed um, in, uh, in compliance with policy H16 of the London Plan. And that explicitly states that affordable housing should not be provided on site, but off site, which the applicant has done. In regards to the topic of air quality, uh, condition number 10, which is provided by regulatory services, explicitly meant, I'll have to see goes over that, and it will ensure that the air quality within the building is at the levels it should be. In regards to overshadowing, the distance between neighboring buildings is considered sufficient to avoid any overshadowing. And with the closest building, the um, daylight and sunlight report included submitted with the applicant also puts that into a quantitative assessment as well. Uh, in terms of the uh, Mr. Gerd's comments about um, local high school requiring a de designation of land or metropolitan open land in order to allow for that to, uh, to be constructed. This is in contrast to the uh, proposed development, which 
has an exception test in the MPPF. And as mentioned before, it has passed the exemption test. Uh, so in that regards, that's where we quantify the fact that it is acceptable in terms of its impact on metropolitan open land. Um, and uh, I think the matter of the coverage of the land that was uh, adequately addressed by the uh, authorized agent, um, it's not uh, open storage, isn't um, openness in terms of open space. It's just the fact that it's an open air use. And that actually means that it is actually previously developed land. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Councillor Ball, I saw you indicate first. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the first two schemes that we, 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 we've already dealt with, they were quite finely balanced, but this one strikes me as different. I, I can't quite understand um, how this wasn't refused by officers under delegated powers, because it just seems to be going against the, our usual, um, the usual way we handle MOL applications, which is that we accept um, very specific circumstances um, for applications on MOL for either for use that relates to um, the, the use of the land. So things like sports pavilions and so on that, that relate to the use of the rest of the land or for educational use. But I mean, as I say, in the case of um, Ada Lovelace, it was um, de-designated first, but we, we have accepted um, schools on MOL elsewhere in the borough. So it, it does seem to me that um, allowing, um, well, I'll ask, ask, ask it as a, uh, I, agree, I agree with Council Bob Gerd. Is this a question? Or yeah, is this it's, a, sorry, I'd say, say one sentence, then I'll ask a question. I, I, I agree with Bob Gerd that it would cause substantial harm to the MOL. So the question is, if this is acceptable, um, does this mean that um, there would be a housing need justification for you know, a similar height building on any um, piece of MOL that has you know, a, 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 small, a small bit of development like a house on it? Yeah, so I would like to refer us back to the MPPF, which provides those very specific circumstances to which uh, development would not be considered inappropriate on metropolitan open land. And as we uh, mentioned previously, this is considered previously developed land, which enables us to go and assess it according to that exception test. And as we mentioned in the committee report, when we, uh, we assess it against those exemption tests, it does pass those tests. So it's not a case of any house being on metropolitan open land enables it to uh, be developed into a multi-story block if it's, meeting a contrib if it's contributing to an affordable benefit housing need and if it has no substantial impact on the metropolitan open land. It's in this case, on this application, in the context that the NBPF provides, it met that. Yeah, can I come uh, back to it? Yeah, I mean... The, the, you just, may come back, yes. Before you start speaking, I will tell you you can start speaking. Okay, carry on, Mr. Council. Thank you, Chair. Um, surely, though, it's the previously developed land test does apply to any any brownfield bit uh, of MOL. So I, I, I'm trying to see what's special about this site, which which doesn't mean that you know any, anything that's technically brownfield on MOL could can have significant size housing developments. Uh, with with respect, I think the officer's actually answered your question when he's pointed to the um, exception in MPPF. Uh, he's going to say it again, I imagine, but. Carry on. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, um, it looks back to the question before with uh, my previous colleague. We can only assess it against what we see. So I can't go and say, oh, this is not, this exception has cannot be used in the future circumstances. All I can say is if in those future circumstances, they meet those parameters as clearly laid out in the MPPF, then we will have to assess it against those exception tests. Um, so any site that that is a situation, then potentially, if appropriate, it might lead to redevelopment, but as MPPF puts forward, it has to meet that specific criteria. Okay, Councillor Conti. Thank you. Um, so just on the basement level flats, um, obviously in the report it says they don't meet the uh, sort of minimum standard for light, but that shouldn't, I think the report says that it, that shouldn't be uh, a sign of, um, should not be considered to be a sign of substandard accommodation. But I was just wondering in terms of how, how far below the minimum light requirement are they? Do all the basement flats have windows? 
Um, are they all windows that could be opened? Um, and then in terms of just air quality, I know you mentioned that once you're inside the block, and I'm assuming with the windows closed, that you've said that there isn't an issue with air quality. I think in reality, they're thinking about the summer months, et cetera, people are going to have their windows open. Um, so, you know, in that case, you know, do we think that, you know, what are air quality standards met? Because it's unlikely that someone's going to have their windows closed 365 days of the year. Thank you. Yeah, so to touch on the air quality topic first, um, that's one of the reasons why we do have that uh, dischargeable condition, so that it is able to lay out um, an acceptable solution. And at that point in time, we will consider things such as, well, is it going to have to be fixed shut, or is it going to allow us to have um, or allow the occupants to open the windows? And one of the things with our air quality, um, uh, our colleagues, they do note that having open air, having that kind of air or having the open windows should be something they're able to do. So once that um, discharge condition application were to come in, we'd have a further look at that to make sure that it is acceptable. Um, when it comes to the overshadowing in the basement units, um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but one of the reasons why we can make that on balance choice that it is acceptable is that the shortfall isn't going to be significant, significant enough where it wouldn't allow design solutions to provide an acceptable amount of light and acceptable quality of accommodation within the units. Um, and I believe that uh, in the basement units that benefit from those, uh, those light wells, they would be able to go out into them, I think all but two of the basement units if I remember correctly. Councillor Gallant. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, 50 plus people um, living in this place. And I, I appreciate there's uh, virtually no car parking space at all, to just space for two parked cars. But 50 plus people are going to generate an enormous amount of deliveries. Everybody's living with deliveries now, um, goods deliveries during the day, uh, food deliveries at night. Um, how, will, how will you mitigate that enormous amount of traffic disturbing one of the most congested stretches of road in the borough. Yes, so this, as this is a uh, Transport for London Network road, uh, TFL were consulted on this and they believe that there's some, um, in this eventuality, there could be a solution where the deliveries wouldn't have a negative or detrimental impact on the highway operations. And that's one of the reasons why we do have a condition that does require the submission and approval of an adequate uh, servicing and delivery plan uh, to ensure that um, the onus is also on the applicant to ensure that they provide those solutions to make sure that it will be acceptable. I'm sorry, Chair. I really you might come back. Could I hear that once more, please? Sorry, I just could, uh, sorry could for I, that. Yes. Could I hear that once more, please? Yes. So, as it is a Transport for London Network road, TFL was consulted on the application. They did indicate that, that it is possible for the delivery and servicing of this particular year of development to be acceptable and not have a detrimental impact on the highway operations of Hangar Lane. That's why it has led to us requiring a condition that requires a submission and approval of a delivery and servicing plan, ensuring that any delivery patterns are up to snuff and they wouldn't have a detrimental impact. It does put the onus on the applicant to bring that forward to us to make sure after we review it in consultation with TFL that it is acceptable. Thank you. Okay, I, I don't see, I, I'm gonna, Make my views known actually. So, uh, using uh, Councillor Stafford's six list of six, I'd just like to come back on some of those. Um, I mean, we, we're talking about loss of metropolitan open land. It, it is, it is in what I deem metro, I know it is technically deemed metropolitan open lands, but it's lost to the metropolitan open land in my view. And that's why it meets the exception test here in front of us from the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, the impacts on metropolitan open land, well, yes, uh, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Whether it's a, a beautiful scheme or a not beautiful scheme. Uh, it's, uh, in some respects, I, when I first saw it, I didn't actually like the, the scheme, the, the actual architecture, but it's starting to grow on me, actually. So, um, because it, it, it's kind of a bit, uh, creative, a bit, a bit of depth in it, et cetera. Um, overdevelopment, I think that we are, we are bound to use the space that we've got. Uh, we are in a, uh, a city, one of the biggest cities in the world. And if there's space, I don't think it's overdevelopment. I think it's reasonable development on the parcel of land that's there. Um, HMO condition, I, I just find that a little bit going beyond the pale, really. It's not an HMO. Councillor Stafford knows it's not an HMO. He's using it to 
play with the scheme. Um, I think it's a, an insult to the scheme to, in, in some respects, and it's trying to drag it down to the dirt. Uh, HMOs have their uh, 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 place in the world as well, and H some HMOs are good HMOs, and I think what he's trying to do, uh, uh, speak to the committee is the worst case of HMOs. So I, I, I would dismiss that if, from me, my personal view. Uh, lack of social housing, well, it's quite clear within the report that the social housing uh, in the new uh, uh, policy from the, LG, the, the mayor's office is that any social housing is a bit offset and given to the local authority under um, what is deemed uh, under viability. So I don't think that's a reason. Air quality, I mean, yes, it's on the North Circular, but so is the metropolitan open land next door to it. So if you want to sit in the field next door to it, you are uh, next to the North Circular, you're having the same amount of lung capacity, or you're probably getting the same pollution. So if it was a metro, if we kept it as metropolitan open land, you could sit on it and you'd still get the same pollution. So for me, none of those things stack up, Councillor um, Stafford. Um, and if for me, uh, I'm minded to uh, approve this application. So uh, I can't see anyone. Oh, Councillor Rice. Thank you, Chair. Could I just ask if there would be any guidance at all in terms of this kind of property, there being children? Because I know it's something that um, Councillor Staff has raised. And I'm just actually looking back, just trying to remind myself what was in the report. But it does say that the, 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 the combination isn't really designed for, for families. So it was not really something that gets considered. But I don't know how we would feel about maybe having children who did maybe come along you know, while someone had a tenancy there. Um, because uh, we've got other things to consider then, such as um, uh, safety uh, across the main road and whether or not a child might come out and start trying to play, for example. I don't know if anything would be applicable. Thank you. So, so what was your question? I'm just really seeing if there's anything that we do have that would be applicable to considering children in such a property, whether or not it would be considered acceptable to really have children there and how would really... I would really approach the situation if there were children who did maybe come along while someone was actually living somewhere, maybe they did have a child. Uh, one of the conditions of this, um, of the, in the recommendation is limiting the occupancy to 59, uh, 59 persons. Um, so it would not, uh, it would not be a child friendly development. Um, and that's something that would um, be noted in the operation management plan. So um, in the instance of someone, um, coming in a situation where they would have to take care of a child. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be uh, possible within the development. They would most likely have to make alternative um, uh, arrangements. Councillor Conti, I'll allow you to come back. But I, I, won't, make a habit of, I, I won't make a habit of bringing people back into the uh, debate because of the lateness of the hour, but carry on, Councillor Conti. No, it was just really to sort of, um, just on on the two issues that, that I raised about sort of air quality, I, I just think there's just something very different about visiting metropolitan open land to go and sit and have a picnic and be there for a, an hour or two than living on a main road and being subjected to pollution all the time. I think that there's a material difference between those two things, and I think you know that you know you're you're you know we're building something that's you know having 50 odd units with 50 potentially you know, if there's two people living in each of them 100 people you know living on a site where you know the air quality levels are you know you know not going to be acceptable and a fifth of these units are sub are below what the minimum light requirements are you know we're talking about 12 out of the 56 units I think is that on there that, that are below that level so you know I think we've got to bear in mind the quality of what we're producing and and I, I understand the need for homes but at the same time we need to be producing things that you know are good for people's physical and mental health and I don't think that you know, on those two factors alone I think we, we I think you know I'm minded to to re uh, reject the the application. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about with that one, it's, as I mentioned before, um, while there may not meet that pure qualitative assessment for that light, uh, there are design considerations that can allow that qu the quality of accommodation provided within the unit as a whole uh, to be acceptable. So it's not, I don't think it's a matter of looking at one aspect and saying it comprehensively fails the living standards test. Um, I think the effort that went into designing it and overcoming that has been achieved with the design 
um, that has that we have resulted in um, for those basement units. Um, and as mentioned, uh, in terms of air quality, um, some of the issues with exposure to air quality that might be only an issue when the windows are open. Um, but that's why we do have that ventilation um, that condition to make sure that it, um, that it will have a source of fresh air as opposed to just a lounging out in a metropolitan open land that is providing open space. Uh, Councillor Summers. Yeah, just coming back on a couple of those points. I mean, um, on the air quality issue, I think, you know, it's it's a complete falsehood. It's not, it's, you know, the council doesn't have a policy banning uh, building of housing next to main roads or knocking down the existing housing. So, you know, the, that's, that's just nonsense that, you know, obviously in an ideal world, you wouldn't have housing near main roads, but we live in London and uh, there are not, um that is the case. Um, just on the other the other point, which I think Councillor Gallant mentioned earlier about deliveries and you know the affecting the hangar lane. I think I think I'm right in saying that there's um, double red lines all along there, so vehicles, for example, you know deliveries wouldn't be able to stop on the main road. They uh, they would have to come off the main road to deliver. Uh, that is correct. That's why we will have that condition for the delivery and servicing plan because they do have to come off the main road. So we will need that uh, the details on how they intend to do so without disrupting traffic along Hangar Lane. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more indications, so I'm minded to go to the vote. Um, okay, all those in favour, please show. And those against? Three. Any abstentions? I can't. Thank you very much. That uh, application passed. Um, Councillor Summers, you raised. Yeah, I'm sure I'm probably not the first person to mention the acoustics in here, which are terrible. I don't know whether we've had any feedback from people listening, you know, online, whether they, you know, can hear, you know, the same or as bad as us. And is there any indication of when we might move to either back into the council chamber or to Percival House? Uh, I'll take that away, Councillor Summers, and I'll speak to officers about that. The acoustics were not very good in here tonight. Some bizarre bizarre they were best at the last planning committee we had for some reason they were poor tonight we also had some poor uh um it issues for a myriad of reasons i imagine but um yeah it would be good to have a different setting than this um i i struggled too with some of the acoustics in here tonight um okay councillor ball well, just on that, Chair, I, I've been sad enough to um, to watch some of these meetings from here, and it, it sounds better at, at home than it does here. So the, the acoustics are a problem for us in this room, and certainly for members of the public gallery and members of the public that turn up. But um, it's actually um, it, it's perfectly intelligible at home because the the output of the, of these mics is fed directly into the system. Yeah, I, but this committee is for us. <laughs> you know, if, if we are the ones to make the decision. If we can't hear absolutely 100%, then we're failing slightly. So let me take that away. If there's a better way of hooking these up with the wider world and getting a better space, i.e. back in the old um, mem uh, chamber, well, we'll have a look. Um, but thank you very much. And thank you. Oh, Mr. Scalpel, is he? He disappeared. Has he just gone out? So I just wanted to thank him uh, for all the years. I think this is his. Well, I can thank him in his absence for the many years he's put into service at Ealing. This is his last planning committee tonight, I believe. Uh, he's off to pastures new. Um, he's, well, he's serving us all, I think. Uh, he's somewhere between us and heaven. Um, should you believe in heaven or? wherever you believe in. 
Um, okay, um, thank you very much, and hopefully the rest of your night is better.